Okay, that is my warning to say we are ready to go. So welcome to our early intervention echo um, session. If Again, if you've not taken a minute, if you'll put your name and contact information into the chat. Um, we will be sharing today's slides in chat as well as our survey. So look for those in our chat. My slides don't want to proceed forward. Um, as you just said, we are recording today's session. Um, if you go back and watch today's session um, in the future, we will be editing out some of the videos just because of confidentiality. So if you all of a sudden see a splice and it's you didn't see the video, that is why we just want to make sure we're honoring um, the participants that allowed Stacy and uh, Ali's group to utilize those videos. Um, ECHO is an interactive community, so please put your contacts and information or questions or anything in chat. Um, you know, being over Zoom now for however many years, we want to make sure that we're still feeling that connection with everybody. Um, so have those conversations during today's sessions. Um, a, another great way to get information and learn from all the amazing people on the call are those case narratives. So if you have a case that you are struggling with or you want to brag and make sure that uh, you have all the great ideas from everybody, please consider uh, sending in a case presentation. It's a great way, again, to just learn from everybody on the call. If we are talking about to anybody or we are unsure, we just wanna make sure that we protect individual privacy. So don't use first or last names, mother's maiden name, where they live, any of those things. If you have any questions, you can reach out to one of our fantastic hub members. They all have, or will now have, an asterisk in front of their name, um, and they will be able to answer any of those questions. If you've never joined an ECHO session, um, just so you're aware, we there's some main components of an ECHO. And the first one is a didactic speaker. Um, and then we have a case presentation and small breakout rooms. And the reason why we do those breakout rooms is to have conversations about the case. Um, I'm really excited today. Uh, I had a colleague that is presenting a case and I just am really thrilled to be able to share a ton of resources and information with her from all of you guys on the call because we're all doing this tough work and it's, it's always nice to hear what other people are suggesting and it may be an idea that I've never thought of before. So um, it's a great way to just build that networking um, with everybody. Again, we just want to know who's on the call and if somebody said something really amazing. I know as a participant, I can reach out to Karen. I can see your name on my screen, so I'm calling you out. But I could, Karen Weaver might have said something really exciting on this call, and I want to make sure that I can follow up with her. So that's why we want to make sure that we rename our participant, uh, rename our profiles, just so we can continue to build that community of practice. Because if I was in person, I would just go over to Karen and say, tell me a little bit more about that comment that you made. But over Zoom and virtual, I can't do that as easily. Um, thanks, Karen, for letting me call you out. I know it's not always fun on that one either. Um, raising your hand, we all know how to do that. But just in case, you can go to the bottom of your screen and do a uh, name, raise your hand, or really just put it in the chat. Our hub members um, will monitor that chat for us, as well as just kind of coming unmute, and um, we'll I'll call on you. Um, to get a credit of attendance, we do ask that you fill out the survey evaluation after it, and I just want to then give you guys a huge thank you. I know with our social communication, we're getting extra surveys so that the U of U's group can also get their information that they want. And so thank you so much for filling out those surveys. It really helps all of us be able to keep these sessions free, 
know that what we're providing is useful to everybody. So thank you. And that's how we then send out our credit of our certificate of attendance. Um, Canvas is where we store all of that information. So if you have any uh, questions or you haven't had access to our Canvas page again, just email us at earlyecho at usu.edu and we will get you access to um, our Canvas page. Another plug for case studies, they really aren't as scary as what we think. Um, you know, we're all amazing people on this call with we want to share our information, um, our knowledge and our expertise and get a uh, great feedback on um, our cases. So please consider uh, reaching out to early echo um, at aggies.usu.edu to submit a case. Um, if you've not followed us on uh, social media, Take a minute and scan our QR codes. They're a great way to get information about any upcoming sessions, uh, resources that people send into us, different things that are going on in the early childhood community world. So um, I'm thrilled today again to introduce the U of U's amazing group that is talking to us about social communication. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Sarah, who is going to take us from there. Great. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And welcome back to our four-part series on social communication. And we are a team of collaborators from the University of Utah, and we had the opportunity to be with you last month as well in March. And my name is Sarah Houghton, as Janelle just indicated, and I'll be starting our session today. However, you'll also hear from Dr. Ashley Stewart later um, in our presentation. So we spent session one talking about definitions and examples of social communication. And we also discussed some reasons why social communication is so important in a child's development. And today we will be building on that. And specifically, we will begin by revisiting some of the reasons why social communication is so important in a child's development, especially in the development of spoken language. Next, we're going to talk about practical strategies, including both formal and informal tools for assessing early communication, early social communication. And finally, we'll discuss some different ways to communicate these concerns with caregivers. Just a quick reminder, Janelle already um, brought this up. We're gonna be showing you some videos today and we have permission from these families to show them with you. We ask for your help in keeping these videos confidential. So before diving into today's content, we wanted to quickly review just a little bit of the information from our first session. We know that infants and toddlers communicate with social partners using a variety of forms of communication shown in the diagram on the left. Children may use these forms of um, communication such as eye gaze or gestures separately but they may, also con they may also coordinate them, these forms, and use them simultaneously, such as pointing to an object and turning and looking at their caregiver. We also know that infants and toddlers use these different forms to communicate for a variety of purposes. These are communicative functions, and they are shown in the figure on the right. So behavior regulation is regulating another's behavior, such as when requesting objects or protesting an activity. And then social interaction, the red square in the middle, is drawing attention to oneself, such as when greeting others or showing off. And then on the right side, the right square, joint attention is drawing attention to an object or event, such as when commenting on an object. A little later in our session today, we'll revisit these forms and functions uh, in the context of assessing prelinguistic social communication. Right now, we're going to move on, but if you're interested in further information, you could, we encourage you to watch or rewatch the recording of our first session back in March. At the end of our last session, back in March, we addressed several key reasons why prelinguistic social communication is so important in a child's development. 
We wanted to take a moment to revisit that and build on that in today's presentation in preparation for talking about assessment um, in of social communication. So to start off, we know that social communication skills are foundational for the development of many important skills, one of which is language. Prelinguistic social communication skills and milestones can be thought of as rungs on the ladder, on a ladder, uh, leading toward the development of spoken language. But if a child is missing rungs on the ladder of prelinguistic social communication, not only might they be missing the foundational skills needed for language, in addition, there may be cascading effects of social communication deficits. Thus, another reason why social communication skill development is so important is to enhance development in many areas and avoid negative cascading effects, such as you can see in the blue arrows, increased challenging behaviors, difficulties forming relationships with others, and perhaps decreased academic performance. So given the potential impact of social communication delays on language and other developmental areas, it is critical to consider a child's prelinguistic social communication skills as we design and implement treatment. A first step in being able to do that is to assess a child's prelinguistic social communication. But before we dive in to talking about how we assess early prelinguistic social communication skills, let's pause for a minute and talk about how you might talk to parents about why prelinguistic social communication matters in the first place. So thinking back to what we have discussed about the link between prelinguistic social communication and the development of language and learning, how might you explain the importance of prelinguistic social communication to a caregiver? Please feel free to unmute yourself and share your answer, or you could answer, or you could enter your answer uh, in the chat in the chat box. Does anyone have any thoughts? So, Sarah, this is Janelle. I can go. Um, Please. I think that one of the ways to explain the importance of those uh, pre-linguistic social communication to a parent is building, like we want that interaction to happen and that connection in order to know that we're talking to somebody and that there's a reason why we communicate with each other. Great, thank you. And Audrey says in the chat, um, I use a speech pyramid we've developed. Oh, fantastic. And um, to talk about those rungs on the ladder, that's great. And Shelby talks about um, scaffolding, the scaffolding effect, the prelinguistic skills build toward verbal and other communication, it shows that there is a bond and an interest in communication. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And Erica's comment, capturing joint attention to build listening and language. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. So having these kinds of conversations with caregivers can provide the opportunity to then introduce the need to learn more about their child's social communication. In this next section, we'll be discussing methods and strategies in assessing these skills in infants and toddlers. So a first question that you or we might ask ourselves is when is the time to assess social communication skills? And really the answer is anytime. There are a variety of circumstances in which assessment of prelinguistic social communication may be warranted. For example, you may notice some potential indicators of a social communication delay when getting to know a child for the first time. Or you may be considering changing a child's goals when creating an IFSP renewal. In another case, a parent may, be, um, may have expressed some concerns to you, such as when they say something like, my child only says one or two words, what can we do? These are just three examples of many possible different scenarios that might lead you to consider assessing a child's social communication. So in thinking about the assessment of social com communication, you might consider where to start. 
And as we've discussed in the previous session in March, the development of early communication begins at birth in the perlo perlocutionary stage in the red box at the bottom or the pre-intentional stage. Here, the infant or toddler uses communicative behaviors such as cooing or smiling that are not intentional. So a first step in assessing social communication may be to determine if the child's communication is intentional or not. Is the child's communication goal-directed or is the individual's communication more reflective of a general state, such as comfort or hunger or sleep? In this case, the child's communication is interpreted primarily by the caregiver or parent based on the child's body movement, sounds, or facial expressions. And you can determine this by observing the child interact with the caregiver. So after you've determined that the child's communication is intentional, then we can start thinking about pre-linguistic in intentional communication. This is the stage we are primarily focused on today. Our purpose here is to move the child up the ladder towards spoken language by developing and strengthening the rungs on the ladder or the skills necessary to climb the ladder. Last month, some of you shared that the tools in the box on the left are some of the measures that you may already be using that give you some clues about a child's social communication skills. These assessment tools may provide beneficial information about potential social communication delays, such as indicators that the child isn't pointing from the MCHAT, or maybe observations that the child doesn't use facial expressions on the Battelle or the PLS. In addition, maybe during sessions with the child, you've observed that the child is doing great with early shared attention and affect and starting to, sh to shift some eye gaze, but they're not using one gesture or maybe the child is not coordinating eye gaze with a gesture. So you have this information from some of the assessments, or maybe you have suspicions of social communication delays, or maybe the caregiver has expressed some concerns. This information is a great start, but we can't create goals from this information. Furthermore, how do we start providing intervention services focused on improving social communication if we don't know where to begin or focus? So we need some more in-depth information, and therefore we need to do we need to directly assess pre-linguistic social communication skills. Let's now talk about taking the next step of directly assessing social communication. And now I'm going to be passing off the baton to mm -hmm. Ashley. Thanks, Sarah. There we go. <laughs> um... Okay, so um, now that we, as Sarah mentioned, have some suspicions about um, delays in social communication or potential delays in social communication, the next step really is to conduct that direct assessment of those social communication skills. And to do this, we can derive information from multiple sources. Um, for example, we can use both behavioral observations in combination with caregiver report. And ideally, having a combination of direct observation along with some parent recorded behaviors is probably going to be the most effective and most comprehensive measurement of social communication abilities. Okay. Um, next, we'll kind of spend uh, a few minutes talking about a more comprehensive measure that has a behavioral observation component as well as a caregiver component. And then um, we will dive into uh, different options of caregiver reports before talking about how to assess in a more um, naturalistic setting. Um, so we're first going to share with you a standardized measure of social communication. This is called the Communication and Symbolic Behavior Skills Developmental Profile, more commonly referred to as the CSBS. Um, the CSBS is a norm referenced measure of social communication. It also um, gives you a measurement of expressive speech and language, as well as symbolic functioning. And um, it includes uh, various components include, that, are, that are known to be predictors of language development, such as gaze, gestures, sounds, words, and even play. 
Um, it includes a screening tool um, as well as a more comprehensive caregiver questionnaire and a behavior sample observation. Um, the nice thing about the CSBS, in addition to it being a norm referenced measure, is that it can be used on um, very young children. In fact, it can be used on infants between 6 and 24 months of age. And it's really a common measure that's used um, to look at pre-linguistic communication that allows for screening and evaluation of social communication delays, as well as assessment to document changes in social communication over time. Something that I know can be really important to you as an early intervention provider. Um, any one of these components that you see of the CSBS can be administered in isolation of the other. So um, while it provides you with a three-part assessment, you can pick and choose which components make the most sense for the child that you're assessing. You can also use all three components as a whole, um, especially if you're in a situation where you're not knowing a lot about the child's social communication, meaning that you're unsure if there are concerns for social communication. So for example, um, you wouldn't necessarily need to use the screening measure or the infant toddler checklist if you already know that there are some delays or concerns. In that case, you could kind of go right to conducting a behavior sample or utilizing the caregiver questionnaire um, because you want more detailed or nuanced information about the child's social communication. The infant toddler checklist is often used as a screening measure. Um, and um, uh, in addition to that, uh, as I mentioned, there is kind of this more in-depth caregiver questionnaire um, that um, dives a little bit more deeply into some of the components that are included on the infant toddler checklist. Um, so the infant toddler checklist um, is actually available for free. You could go and download it right now. It's available online and you could put it into practice right away. Um, the scoring is fairly simple for it. Um, and like I mentioned on the earlier slide, it's pretty quick to administer. So it doesn't take a lot of time. So it's a nice uh, tool that you have at your ready right now. Um, I'll show you an example of the more direct observation of social communication behaviors um, through what's for, through the CSBS behavior sample. In the behavior sample, um, there are a series of communicative temptations that the examiner uh, presents to the, the infant or toddler um, with the caregiver present in order to try to elicit spontaneous communication. So I'll show you one example of those. Um, an activity from that. <clears throat> Ashley, you might have said this, but can anyone <clears throat> do it or does it have to be an SLP? Great question. It's coming up on the next slide, but um, it does not have to be an SLP. Um, early interventionist, psychologist, speech language pathologist, really any professional that is um, has been trained to evaluate young children can can administer the CSBS. Um, I apologize. I have lost the control to swap my screen. Yeah, okay. I don't know. I did the same thing. <laughs> Um, all right, so um, the CSBS is also organized into three composite scores, so you'll get measures of um, social behavior, speech, as well as symbolic behavior, and um, each information includes different components of social communication. And then um, to the prior question, this is um, who can administer the CSBS. If you were to go and purchase the CSBS, um, it does include training videos that come along with it. So it's something um, that you don't have to seek out necessarily a lot of it, um, uh, additional training in order to administer it. Um, for the behavior sample in particular, I do think it's helpful to note that um, videotaping can be useful for it, but it's not required for that particular portion.
Um, so now that we've talked about the CSBS, there are also other um, options in the evaluation skills of infant and toddlers. So let's talk a little bit more about some caregiver report options. Um, one caregiver report tool that's available is the social communication uh, checklist. This checklist can be used for children up to age six. Um, it can be helpful in creating and determining social communication goals. It provides um, pretty substantial information on social communication behaviors, but um, it can be important to note that it could be pretty time consuming to complete. Um, it, like the CSBS, can be used as um, a, a tool to evaluate change over time, especially when it's used before and after a brief social communication intervention. The social communication checklist um, comes from the Teaching Social Communication to Children with Autism and Other Developmental Delays program um, or Project Impact. It's a coaching um, guide that we'll talk about in subsequent sessions. At our last session, we presented the social communication growth charts as a way of keeping track of social communication milestones. And these growth charts may also be useful for assessing the presence or absence of certain social communicative behaviors. Um, as you can see with each uh, area, there's um, often substantial information included about what it looks like to do things like share and manage emotions, um, which can be helpful in making sure that you're obtaining really adequate information. Parent diaries can additionally be a useful tool in gathering information about social communicative behaviors, um, especially those that occur outside of intervention or assessment sessions. So in this example on the screen, the parents recorded several different gestures used by the child. Um, they've indicated the object or person that's being referred to, noted whether or not the gesture was imitated or spontaneously produced, who the gesture was directed towards and the context in which the gesture occurred. While this particular parent diary is focused on gestures, they're just one example of social communicative behaviors that could be tracked in a parent diary. So for example, if you wanted to get a communicative functions, you could create one um, focused specifically on communicative functions. And um, this is another um, a nice tool in the fact that you can kind of make and mold this to whatever you feel like is really pertinent information for you to be gathering. Um, next, we want to talk about how to obtain social um, uh, information on social communicative behaviors by conducting natural, naturalistic observations. So, um, uh, uh, in order to kind of assess social communication informally during your sessions, we're really assessing the child to determine a baseline or a starting out point. And this makes it easier to plan goals and intervention and track growth. So we can do this by observing various aspects of social communication during caregiver and child interactions. Um, this table is an observation that or it lists some of the ways that we can observe social communication behaviors. So Sarah mentioned earlier in the session that different forms and functions of um, social communication can be really important aspects to, to obtain. In the middle column, you see um, the range of different functions that the child uses to communicate being tracked. In the third column, we compare the number of times a child uses these forms and function with a number of opportunities they have. This is um, our way of kind of gauging the intentionality of communication. And it's really that combination of the forms of communication along with the function. And then finally, in the um, rightmost column, we can observe the child's responses to their name or even bids to communication. So when communicative behaviors are directed toward the child, what does their response look like? Um, when you're setting up and arranging the environment to conduct a naturalistic observation, we want to make sure that we are setting the child up to elicit a lot of different social communication behaviors. 
So um, some strategies that we can do are to um, provide a lot of materials and a, lot, a large variety of materials in order to um, hopefully elicit a range of social communication. So having things ranging from toys, snacks, as well as different types of activities to engage in. And um, more than that, we want to put these materials on different levels, some of them outside of the reach of the child, or using things like clear containers with toys or snacks inside so that the child can't open the container alone, um, trying to, again, to kind of elicit that, that help or requesting behavior. Um, we also want to use toys or activities that the child can't operate or start alone. So giving them a closed container of bubbles or a toy that needs winding in order for it to work. And I think um, an important thing to think about as you're kind of setting up an environment for a naturalistic observation is that what materials you select will certainly impact the type of communication you see. So for example, if you're doing a book activity, um, the child is typically going to sit in the lap of the caregiver with their back towards their caregiver. So while reading a book, we might see something like pointing to pictures in books, but we may not see as much shifting of gaze or coordinated eye contact along with the gestures due to the positioning in that particular activity. Um, when um, you are conducting a naturalistic observation, it's also important to clarify the role for the caregiver in the observation. Um, caregivers are really critical when we're assessing social communication. They're the child's first communicative partner. Um, and so uh, they definitely have a really strong role in the assessment of social communication behaviors. Um, however, we um, also want to know whether or not we're trying to measure um, spontaneous communication versus if we're wanting to have a more important or, or a more fixated role on a child's response to communication. So in some cases, you, um, such as when you want to see the child's spontaneous communication, you might need to direct the caregiver to, to be more of a passive participant, um, kind of hanging back, uh, so to say, during that portion of the evaluation. We wanna see how your child spontaneously communicates. So why don't you sit near them while they play, but try to avoid directing their behavior. If they come up to you and approach you, you can respond how you normally do, right? Um, but on the other hand, sometimes you might want them to be really heavily involved in the activity. So if that's the case, you can give them some specific instructions on how to interact with the child. Um, just make sure that this is kind of an ongoing conversation about the role and your role in each part of the assessment. Um, this is an example of a form you could use to do a behavioral observation in a naturalistic setting. So while watching a parent and a child interaction, you could tally the number of communicative forms that occur while simultaneously tallying in what context they occur or what communicative function they have. For example, you could observe a point marked in the gesture column um, that is request, oops, sorry about that, that is requesting a cup from off the sink. Um, that would be in the behavior regulation row um, or a point that's commenting about an airplane in the sky that would fall in the joint attention role. Um, the form that I'm showing you right now is available for download at the website at the bottom of the slide. We're also going to include a link to it in the chat um, because we're about to practice using the form and conducting just a really brief naturalistic observation together. So, um, that kind of gives you some ways of conducting the assessment, but I wanted to briefly touch about how to communicate the results of the assessment. 
Um, so in conveying results, you really want to describe to the caregiver what the assessment looked like, how you collected the data. Um, was it something where you used a standardized measure and the scores are comparing the child to a, a population of children the same age um, or a population of children with developmental delays? Um, or is it something where there's a cutoff score, right? Um, also talk about the observations that you made um, during the, the assessment and make those in comparison to what a child of that developmental level should be able to do. And most importantly, really involving the caregiver in the discussion of the assessment results. So asking the caregiver questions like, are these observations, is this data that I'm presenting to you, is this consistent with kind of your views of your child and what you've seen from your child's social communication behavior? And, um, you know, more, most importantly, I think, too, letting the caregiver know that while this helps us to, you know, kind of understand where the child's functioning right now in terms of their social communicative behaviors, it also gives us a base for measuring progress over time. So now that we can create goals and plan intervention, we can look back at this data after we've done some, um, some treatment and see what progress looks like. So today in session two, we talked about the assessment of social communication concern and how to communicate those concerns with caregivers. But in our next session next month, we're going to actually dive into how to apply um, and um, how to uh, start to intervene in children where you, um, where you are suspecting some delays in social communication. And then uh, just a reminder that, as Janelle said, I know you guys are inundated with uh, surveys, but it is very helpful for us if you can um, complete the early intervention social communication survey. That just helps us to, to utilize what you guys are already doing in your practice, tailor our, our um, teachings to the things that you're doing, um, and hopefully gauge where you're at in your learning. So thanks again for having us this month, and we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. That was such useful information and I loved it. Um, so wonderful. Um, I'm going to ask Alyssa if she will come off mute and share her slides. She's going to join, she's going to um, share the case for us today. Okay. Um, so I have a kiddo on my caseload that I've been working with for about five months involved in his communication, um, and they specifically want him to use his voice. Mom is pretty um knows a lot of sign language dad says she's fluent but she says she's not so <laughs> um that's where they are they've been teaching him some signs but he um just really struggles with making sounds like they'll break down the words for him and he'll copy them all one by one but um he struggles with uh copying the whole word together um, so we've worked on doing like consonant vowels and trying to get more of those um, and increasing the different sounds that he uses. We've worked on like using a lot of word approximations and he's very good at communicating in general. Like he has so many different sounds, so many different gestures and things that he's using that his parents know like exactly what he wants all the time. But he is having a really hard time talking and using words specifically. Um, so I guess my questions for you guys are, um, oh, and then when we did work on specific sounds last month, I'm trying to expand those. They were like, he's not really interested in that. So we just kind of stopped doing it. So I guess my question for you guys is how do we help parents stay motivated and continuing to work on those things? Like um, we used hand cues, um, like pop, 
things like that to help him visually see the sounds. Um, and then just like a ton of repetition in words. But how do we help them to stay motivated and continue to use strategies and work on things when progress is so slow and his parents are both working and super busy? And then how can we address parent concerns of wanting him to say words and use words, um, but also support him through like alternative means of communication, like signs or uh, communication boards or other ways so that he can communicate more efficiently with others, including people outside of his family. Does it, do any of you have questions about the case or this before we discuss? I have I'm a gonna... question. Oh, okay. I just was wondering about clarification. So you said that mom knows a lot of sign language and he's doing gestures. Will he copy some of these signs? Like, um, yeah, he has a good amount of signs. I think he's okay. using about 20 right now, um, which is still an expressive language delay, even if we are sit, like counting the amount of words that he's using with those signs. But he is using some of them. I think he started doing like mo with more. Um, so he is starting to pick up on some of those signs and starting to put a sound with it. This there is, is also, oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, this is Rebecca. I was just going to ask if he has a diagnosis or if you have concerns about other areas of development. Um, I haven't been as concerned. He's pretty good at communicating and engaging with others. Um, but, um, I have wondered about if there's like a phonological thing, like he's struggling to say the sounds, um, and maybe even like apraxia of speech. Um, but his vocabulary is just so limited. It's hard to know. But good question. So does he have any siblings is another question that is being asked. Um, he has a baby sister. And then there was also a question about, is there concerns about apraxia? Um, yeah, well, I have considered that. I'm, it's kind of concerning where you're like, he can copy the sounds when they're broken down, but when he tries to put them all together, um, He's not necessarily doing that right. His mom always relates it to the friends scene where Joey's trying to learn French and they like break it down in words. And then when they try and put it together, he's like, Doo -doo -doo -doo, right? That's um, so funny. Yeah. And then history of ear infection or hearing tested. Um, He did get his hearing tested at our intake so about six months ago and there were no concerns about it um but I could definitely go in and do another OAE and see how it goes and follow up on ear infections but I haven't heard any I think they said they had no concerns about hearing or ear infections before but that was a good thing to follow up on okay well, um, I'm going to be moving. Oh, Kirsten, I just saw you come off mute. So ask your question. Okay. Just one more question on the where he can break the sounds down, but then he can't put them together. Does he just vocalize one syllable at a time? Is there a history of breathing issues? Is it a breath support issue? Or is, does he string a bunch of gibberish together? Yeah, um, he usually reverts back to one sound. So like, well, they said with like open is one they specifically have been working on. Um, and he'll like do the syllables open. But then when we try and say open, he's like, oh, yeah. and um, but I'll have to look into the breath support. That's I mean, okay. like take notes of everything. <laughs> 
See again, already just a great <laughs> suggestion from um, just asking those questions. Just so everybody is aware, I will be popping um, Alyssa in and out of breakout groups, um, but we're gonna take a minute to, and when we go into the breakout groups, uh, please take a minute and introduce yourselves, turn your cameras on. Again, it's that way to build that community of practice. Please don't everybody just jump off. It's a great way to just utilize things. I'm gonna go over the hub members who are going to be leads. So Kirsten, you are a lead in your breakout group and you'll be going over how can I help and support parents to stay motivated. We'll drop these into chat too so you can see them really quick. And then Shelby, you're in another breakout group that is taking that same question Crystal, you are in a breakout group lead that is going to be talking about how can we address parents' concerns um, using his voice more. So that question number two. And Rebecca, you will also be doing lead on that same question. Um, so we had a little bit of a glitch with our breakout rooms, so I hope that's how they have ended up, but um, if not, uh, you guys, amazing Hub members, all know how to take that care of it. So I'm going to put you guys all in breakout groups. Welcome back, everybody. We have a few minutes that sometimes we are so rushed and we don't always have time to do this, but I'm going to have each of the hub members um, just share one idea. So Shelby, you're the first person on my screen. So what's one idea from your guys' group? Yes, yeah, so we talked about how to help and support parents stay motivated when progress is slow um, and parents are already so busy. And... Um, we talked more about finding something that they're already doing to focus on. So for example, um, you know, if he really likes going outside, you know, every time you open the door to go outside, you say open or out or, you know, something like that. And then just praising any kind of vocalization that he has or tries to say during those interactions. Awesome. Um, Crystal, how about your group? Mm, I wasn't the note taker this time. Sure. Um, okay, who was? Talked, Rebecca? <laughs> Rebecca was. Okay, we Rebecca. Talk about visual supports and um, maybe working into some AAC devices. Um, ours was on helping other forms of communication and helping anticipate some of that vocal, some maybe play sabotaging to get some more words. Oh, awesome. Good. Yes. Okay, Kirsten, you're next up on my screen. Okay, so um, we were on the motivation piece and we discussed a lot of different strategies, but as far as motivation goes, um, I think one of the big ones that came up a couple of times in a couple of different ways was to really celebrate the successes of both the child and the parents. So, so you know, really acknowledge all the hard work that the family's doing, um, but also help the family to recognize the progress that the child's made. So sometimes in the day to day, you, you kind of don't realize the changes that have taken place. And so just being able to say, wow, you know, remember a couple of months ago, he wasn't doing this at all, but now he really is. Um, and recognizing that progress does help with that motivation because then they realize that, that yes, the child, it, it's actually working. The child is doing, doing better. Yeah, I love that. Reminding this, us that we have made a little bit of progress, right? I have to remember that with my running all the time that, I can now run a, a, a half marathon without dying when before I didn't think I could run a mile. So, you know, I've come a long ways. Kate, how about yours? We, yeah, we talked about celebrating the steps as well, um, the progress as well. But we also talked about the idea of pressure and how that might be affecting the child and their ability to feel confident communicating, but also the pressure that the parents might be feeling that might be leading to some of the discouragement in their motivation and 
you know, having those conversations about like comparing our kids to other kids and you know how to handle that and how to not feel that pressure and be content or happy and positive about where their child is at right now. Oh, that's an awesome one. Um, Kate is, because I'm in a reminder right now, she's going to drop her email into the chat. If everybody will send her your notes, she'll compile them for us, Alyssa, and then I'll get those sent out to you. Um, just so everybody else on the call is aware, all of the recommendations are saved on our Canvas page. So if you ever want to go back and utilize these with other clients that you're working on, that you might be encountering the same struggles, and I think it's always hard to keep parents motivated or um, do that. So going back and reviewing them, they are always accessible on Canvas. Um, and then if you'll also take a minute to complete the ECHO survey, that would be fantastic. And our next session will be May 1st, um, and we'll be going over social communication part three. And again, a plug for a case presentation. If anybody wants to present a case, they are really a great way to get a ton of resources and suggestions. So reach out to us if you do. And if not, hopefully where you're at is sunshiny. It's sunny up here in northern Utah. So I'm really excited. And Crystal, don't even come off mute and tell me how warm it is down there. I won't. <laughs> but you have the influx of all northern Utah down there. We have the traffic. Yes, we do. Yeah. <laughs> it's our kids spring break. So well, thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day and take care.